So what do you think could have made that image, um, even in modern terms? You know, that's been the ultimate question from the beginning. Actually, in 1976, I was operating a commercial photography studio in Santa Barbara and specialized in technical, medical, scientific photography and uh, was uh, asked to become a consultant on a project for Los Alamos National Laboratories. Mm -hmm. And uh, that project lasted about seven months. And at the end of that project, one of the gentlemen I worked with called me up and asked me what I knew about the Shroud of Turin. And my response is, or was, uh, but I'm Jewish, so I didn't know much about the Shroud of Turin and didn't really care much about the Shroud of Turin at that moment. And uh, he explained to me that some new image properties had been discovered about the Shroud. Well, you know, Barry, you don't have to be Jewish to not be interested in the Shroud. It's a very controversial relic, even among many Christians. Oh, of course it is. Actually, maybe we should show the picture of the Shroud while you're talking on the uh, generator. Yeah, if you want to, I think, Barry, your website is Shroud. It's shroud.com. Shroud.com. It, it so, should be up so on the So you grandfathered that in. But so then what happened? So this guy invited you to take pictures of the Shroud? Well, he, had, uh, he told me that they were putting together a scientific team of experts in various disciplines, and they were going to need a good technical photographer, and asked me if I would be a participant. Uh, I was hesitant because I didn't feel very interested in the subject, but when they started showing me some of the image properties of the Shroud that had been recently discovered, um, that did catch my interest, and ultimately I stayed on the team and became the official documenting photographer for the project, and uh, also uh, produced a series of maps of where the different experiments were done and where samples were taken from the Shroud which were ultimately published in the scientific literature. So uh, my involvement began at the time, but I was a total skeptic. I expected to get to Turin and take a look and see the paint and the brush strokes and come home. And I would say 10 minutes into the examination of the shroud, I pulled out my trusty 10X magnifier and I uh, took a look at the, some of the image areas and there were no paint, no particles, no particulates, no binders, no pigments, or anything. As a matter of fact, the image areas are so subtle when you look at them up close that it's almost impossible to detect image from background. The difference is only about 3% in darkness between shroud and uh, if background and image. So that so, three that 3% when you step back gives the subtle image? That's correct. And when you get close to it, it's hard to see. But as you get back away from it, much like a half tone in a newspaper, if you look at it too close, it's not very coherent but when you back away to normal viewing distance, which for the shroud is maybe 10 feet away, then the image becomes more clear again. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, when we photograph it and increase the contrast, you see the very famous dark background light image of the man that is so famous now. Right. So what do you think could have made that image, um, even in modern terms? You know, that's been the ultimate question from the beginning. Our team's primary goal was to determine how the image was formed. Uh, we went there using every test known to man at that point in scientific uh, te uh, technology to examine the cloth, but always non-destructively, so we, we would cause it no harm. And because conventional wisdom was that it might be a painting, we took with us the sort of scientific tests that are typically applied to art authentication, uh, we did x-ray fluorescence and ultraviolet fluorescence and reflectance photography, we did spectral analyses, we, did, uh, we lifted samples, tape samples, sticky tape samples from the surface of the cloth so that uh, chemical analysis could be done, different types of spectral analysis. So our, our goal was to figure out how the image was made and after all was said and done, uh, we were able to tell you what the shroud is not. It's not a painting, it's not a photograph, there's no silver anywhere on it, so it couldn't have been made with a photographic emulsion. 
And of course, the image has properties unlike any other photograph you've ever seen. Like what kind of properties? Well, the, prim the primary property uh, that's different is that there's a correlation between the image density or darkness and the distance the cloth was from the body when the image was formed. Oh. Top of the nose, top of the hands, forehead, where there was direct contact with the cloth and body, uh, the image is darkest. As the distance increases, however, the image becomes more faint, and they've been able to determine the imaging distance was about four centimeters, which means there was imaging going on where there was no contact with the cloth, and at four centimeters, that's it. There was no more imaging. Mm. So what we have encoded into the shroud's image is in effect spatial or distance information when that is extracted using different techniques, uh, imaging techniques, you get the natural relief of a human form. No photograph can do that, no artwork can do that, and that makes the shroud image quite unique in my point of view. I wonder, has anyone done a sculpture of that based on those um, distances? Yeah. No? Absolutely, as a matter of fact, uh, there have been several sculptures done, several paintings done from the Shroud, and most recently on a History Channel documentary, uh, The Real Face of Jesus, uh, Ray Downing, who also I believe lives in New York, um, uh, is a computer graphics expert, and he extracted the image of the data in the Shroud image and created a 3D human-like form that uh, you know, basically shows us what the man looks like without the inherent distortions of the cloth and other limitations that the shroud's image has. Now, Remember, it's a 2D image on a, on a sheet of cloth, so extracting 3D uh, and getting a natural relief is unique. I'm really glad that you told me he lives in New York because I'm going to try to contact him because I was doing some TV work with the shroud with J.J. Hertog and one of the documentaries I liked a lot showed uh, Jumper and Jackson, I think, at an Air Force base in Colorado. Yes, that who, was a, quite an old documentary. That one's probably about 30 years old. Hmm. Uh, but but they, they still had something, the VOR? Uh, VP-8 image analyzer. It, it, say that more slowly. The VP-8 image analyzer. It's simple. It stands for Vector Processor 8-Bit. That's VP-8. VPA. And, and that was the green screen display device that they first applied to the shroud and saw the natural relief of a human form. And it was making that discovery that was the catalyst for Jackson and Jumper to form the team called STIRP, or Shroud of Turin Research Project, and ultimately obtain permission to go examine the clock. Now, is that when you were just sort of a nice Jewish photographer in Santa Barbara, when you heard about that? Did that get you interested in no, it? Because they actually invited me to become a participant because I had done a seven-month consulting project for Los Alamos, and they knew that I was a good technical photographer. No, I, I understand that, but you said you weren't that interested in it. Well, I, I, it was the image properties that hooked me in. Like which image yeah, properties? Yeah, which image hooked? properties? Well, the one I just described, the spatial or... Uh, I see three-dimensional, it's not really 3D, but spatial or depth information. Right. Can you explain how that works for the viewer? Just well, it's difficult to explain how it works. It's that we know that the image formation mechanism, whatever it was, operated at a distance from the cloth, between the cloth and body of up to four centimeters. The image is darkest where there was direct contact, and as the distance increases, the image grows more faint until it reaches extinction at about four centimeters. Hmm. So what we really have is an image encoded based on distance between cloth and body. Hmm. That's unique to any other imaging technique. But the, but the vortex process analyzer, it really wasn't developed to analyze the Shroud of Turin. What was that device or technology used for? Yeah, the, the, the VP-8 was being used at Sandia Laboratories, which is a sister laboratory to Los Alamos National Labs. And they were using it to examine and extract information from x-rays. I see. And the x-rays were quite subtle, and the differences were very limited between the values. So they used the VP-8 to sort of expand out those values and see in more depth and detail what the x-rays were showing. So, so in other words, if you had an x-ray of your body, and you've got the top, the front part of the ribs, and then the back part, 
that process will show you which one is closer and which one is farther? It will not. Oh, it won't? It won't. It'll only show you the difference in values or tone. Oh, and then from the difference in values, you estimate the distance? No, uh, no. The shroud's image yields a three-dimensional result. X-rays, photographs, artworks do not. Oh, really? I see. So that was so unique about the shroud particularly. So um, the other thing, so in a sense, it is like a photograph in, in a sense because it's, it's an image that somehow light interacted with something to create the image, no, right? We don't, we don't believe it was light. I don't oh. think it was light. What do you but, think it was? But, but here's the difference. I mean, it, look, yeah. the, the image itself is got, has got one property that's like a photograph, and that is that the lights and the darks of an image that we're used to seeing, you know, light highlights, dark shadows, that's inverted, just like a photographic negative where the lights and darks right. are reversed. Right. But that's it. That's the only property the shroud has that makes it photographic-like. All the other properties of the shroud's image are unlike any photograph or artwork that, that I've looked at, and I've looked at tens of thousands in my career. And so uh, there are unique properties in the shroud's image. And of course, it's difficult for me over the phone here to try and explain these verbally when these are things that could be shown a little right. easier visually. Right, okay. Right, and we'll put some pictures of that up. But so overall, something made the image that you still don't know what it is. Is that what you're saying? In essence, we can tell you what it's not, not a painting, not a photo, but we can't tell you a mechanism that can create an image on a sheet of linen with the physical and chemical properties we find of the shroud's image itself. So if you were going to go a little way out there and give us a, a guess or imagine what would it be that would create it if you could make something up like or are that? Are we cutting to the chase too soon, <laughs> Barry? Well, not to worry. I can, I can tell you this, that from a scientific point of view, if I were going to give you a scientific answer, mm -hmm. then the answer would be that there could have been an interaction between the cloth and the, there's a surface material on this cloth from when it was washed, when it was manufactured, that I don't want to get too technical, but it was called saponaria or soapweed, and they used it sort of as a fabric softener after they wove the cloth because the cloth was still stiff. Right. And so they would wash it in this natural occurring fabric softener, if you will, and that was a, from the plant called soapweed. Uh, when they washed and rinsed it, they then air dried it, and it dried by evaporation, leaving a very thin coating, a few microns thick, on the top surface of all the fibers, that's what happens when you dry something by evaporation. It leaves a residue on the top surface of the fibers. Uh -huh. And that, that residue, without getting too technical, is a pento sugar or polysaccharide. And one of our chemists from Los Alamos uh, did some research and discovered that there's something called a Maillard reaction that gives beer its distinctive golden color, that makes bread its golden color. And that reaction could have caused a change, a chemical reaction with the saponaria on the surface. And Rogers determined that a human body after death exudes amines, uh, ammonia gas being one of the first that comes out of your nose and mouth from your lungs. And it eventually comes out of all of your pores. And that could have caused a chemical interaction with the saponaria on the surface of the fibers and discolored them, causing the image that we find. So it's on the shroud does not soak into the cloth. It rests, resides solely on the top surface of the fibers. But this, but but any body that was covered and and has died and is, I guess that's a process of decomposition. The amines and that early ammonia. stages of decomposition. Yes. Excuse me. The early stages of decomposition. So anyone would have that same effect on a shroud then, or a, a, a you know. The problem with that, people always say, well, why don't we have other shrouds? Well, right. other shrouds go around the body, they get put in a grave, the body decays, the cloth decays along with it, and we don't have intact shrouds uh, that aren't soaked by the uh, liquefaction process of decay. The Shroud of Turin was separated from the body it wrapped at some point early in the process before any uh, liquid decay began of that body. And uh, there was a, you know, I don't know why the cloth was separated from the body uh, from a scientific or historic point of view, 
but of course we can we can look at uh, the Christian faith and say that their belief is is the body was resurrected and left the tomb. So uh, we don't have a, the scientific characteristics of resurrection to be able to do science on that point. Resurrection is truly a term based in faith and not in science. Well, and let's say it's let's say we get away from the Christian idea of resurrection, and because if you look at that shroud uh, from a spiritual point of view, it looks like the crown chakra has something, or the top of the head had some kind of light pouring into it. I think it's possible to resurrect the body. I mean, my belief about the shroud is that perhaps the life force or whatever it was came back into the body after it was wrapped, and in a sense it was resurrected. Um, you know, look, I'm, I'm not disputing that as a possibility. Right. All, all I'm saying is that from a scientific point of view, we can't go into a laboratory and resurrect bodies to see what effects we can create on cloth. So, <laughs> you know, resurrection is a test of faith, not science. So well, there's at, a limit to what science can tell us. We examined a physical piece of cloth. We mm. did chemistry and physics and every other type, type of test possible. And we we're able to determine certain characteristics of the cloth and its image. But we still don't know a mechanism that can create an image with that physical characteristics that we find on the shroud uh, and create the physics and chemistry that we find there. Well, there I, I'm not into, process. but I'm not into faith. I'm into just considering possibilities. Is it possible that whatever made that image came from the, the body outward as a emanation of energy, let's say? Well, some people believe that. Uh, but the testing that was done on the shroud, particularly on the image fibers, uh, we were looking for things like radiation effects on linen, which are clearly and well documented in the uh, scientific literature. And we know that radiation will impact or have an impact on linen fibers like they will on anything else. And the only radiation impact found on shroud fibers is the standard sort of gamma ray radiation that we're all receiving even as we speak. And in other words, a very natural background radiation, but no impact from any other types of radiation sources. So, you know, one can speculate anywhere you want to, but we're sort of restricted by the bonds of science. To well, the, sort of talk well, about the, things that the, we're the bonds of least you're testing anyway, because science can only test for what it, it can't test. If it doesn't have a test for something, it doesn't mean it's not there. I mean, that's I, the limitation of science. You know, you know actually, I, Barry, I want to say something. I want to re remind Alan that we were at the library maybe a year ago or maybe even more, and I picked up a Jewish encyclopedia, and resurrection is a feature of Judaism. It, it comes from Judaism. Absolutely. Yeah, so much so that it's believed that the Lutz bone, which is at the base of the spine, needs to be preserved in order for this process to take place. Mm. Well, at least I, that's I wanna, what it... The only point I want to make to you, Alan, is that there is no scientific test for resurrection, so we're sort of left there with having to leave science and step away from it, and then one can extrapolate any of the theories from either Jewish or mm. Christian or, uh, uh, faith. Or, or Hindu, because it right. seems like on the top of the head there, there does seem to be some light coming in through. Oh, uh, there's a water stain there, Alan. Oh, it's a water stain. <laughs> oh, that clears that up, thank you. You're talking about the kind of the U-shaped thing above the head. Yeah. Can we have a picture of the shroud? Or the, no, that, that's the, the water stain, I'm sorry. That, Alan. that one on the oh, top. Oh, that's a water stain? Oh, you yes, just sir, ruined it, it for me. And no. there's the problem. We're looking at a black and white photograph of an image that has been contrast enhanced. So, you know, that, and, and it's only in black and white, which means you're not seeing what's actually on the shroud, but a representation that's been somewhat manipulated just to produce the image. So oh. you have to be careful in extrapolating what you think you see and right. what is actually there. And, and then you right. also say, Barry, that when you're up close, it's so subtle that you hardly see anything either. That's true. So, so it's, when it's on public display, they keep people around 20 feet away from it, not just for security reasons, but so that it's easier for them to see the image. Oh, right. I see. I didn't realize. So the actual image is a lot fainter than these reproductions. When people go and see the shroud in Turin while it's on display, the biggest surprise they're going to have is just how subtle the image is. 
Oh, I see. The other big thing was the carbon dating, and some documentary saw they said they carbon dated and it was a lot um, more recent, but then they realized they were carbon dating the fungus that was growing or the mold that was growing. Certain, no, the fungus, that business just came out in the last few days, and I, I'm not in agreement with that uh, because the laboratories use some very powerful solvents to clean the materials and it would have taken away any fungus. Mm -hmm. However, the real issue is the little piece that they took from one corner and divided between the laboratories, uh, that little piece came from an area that we believe has either been repaired or rewoven because we found dye, we found a gum arabic base to apply the dye. It looks like it was rewoven and then retouched to match the color of the rest of the shroud. Oh. And so the, the carbon dating wasn't wrong only where they took the single sample from became the issue and there are hopes that in some point in the future a new radiocarbon dating of the shroud will be done that will take samples from different areas of the cloth and you don't need very much anymore so you won't have to destroy the cloth to test it and uh, perhaps a more valid radiocarbon date can be achieved at some point in the future. Well, Do you, do you believe the shroud is 2,000 years old? I do. And do you believe it could be someone like a Jesus? I do. Why? Because in the uh, documented history of the uh, Roman crucifixion process, um, they crucified a lot of people, thousands of them. They scourged thousands of them, and there are 120 scourge marks on the man of the shroud. They speared many of them in the side, I'm sure. But there's only one man in documented history that we know of. Oh, you can't say it's documented history. There you okay. become a little Christian. Fair enough, fair enough. Okay, okay, then there's only one man in any recorded information. How's that? Okay. <laughs> that had a crown of thorns applied to his head because he proclaimed himself the king of the Jews. So they put this crown of thorns on his head and it went all to over humiliate him. Okay, here's your crown if you're the king. And all they, they didn't make a pretty little crown and put it on his head. Imagine a Roman soldier weaving a crown. Yeah. Ridiculous. They took a thorn bush and they smashed it on his head and said, okay, here's your crown. And there are blood stains all over this man's head, uh, not just around, in a circlet around his head, but all over the top and back of his head as well, indicating that his head was severely wounded by what appears to be thorns or something like thorns. But along those lines, Barry, um, I read a little article that my mother sent me from a religious magazine, and it was very simply written, and it was very moving how you were quoted. It, it, what I left with was that you had this photography gig, you went to Italy, you did it, and then, as the years went on, it was sort of, I don't know if the word is haunting, but... Well, yeah, you, let me, let you've, me you've, about that. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I already explained that I was totally skeptical, but after 10 or 15 minutes in the room with the shroud, I knew it wasn't a painting. I, I don't know anybody who's seen it up close and personal who says it's a painting. It's nothing like any painting anybody's ever seen. Mm. But after we finished our work, which was over a period of three years, and our work was published in 24 different scientific articles in peer-reviewed scientific journals, we were finished. And I had all this material sitting around, and you know, they say Jews and Catholics always feel guilty about something. I, uh, they said what? And Jeez. so I felt somehow that I hadn't finished what I'd begun. And the years went by, and I was still a skeptic. I had not been convinced. It wasn't until almost 18 years after holding that piece of cloth in my hand that the science, the last piece of science, came in and I was then convinced that the only answer is that it's authentic. You know, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle once said that when you eliminate all the possibilities, whatever remains, no matter how improbable, is most likely the answer. And by process of elimination, I came to the conclusion in about 1995 that the shroud was authentic. Wait. And I, I was still feeling kind of guilty that I had been somehow finished. And it was then that a friend of mine called me and told me that he uh, thought that the shroud was done by Leonardo da Vinci. And I said, wait a minute, you know, the shroud's documented 100 years before Leonardo was born. It's a great story, but he wasn't that good of an artist. <laughs> and uh, my, I asked my friend, where did you get the information? 
and he told me he got it when he and his wife were checking out at the grocery store and they saw it on a tabloid. And at that moment I realized that I had the inside track of information but the general public was being fed a bunch of manure mm. by the media that wasn't even true. They were talking about things our team did that weren't even true. And so I decided at that moment while I was still on the phone with my friend that I should build a website. And I wrote that on a folder on my desk, consider building a website. And I built Shroud.com, which went online January 21st, 1996. And the rest, as they say, is history. Wait, but what was that one last piece in 1995 that got you, you know, convinced? 18 years after you touched the cloth. Good question, Alan, and yeah. here's the answer. The blood on the shroud is still reddish in color, and from the beginning, that was a deal breaker for me and for many of the other members of the team. In 1995, I spoke with Dr. Alan Adler, the world-renowned blood chemist, top man in the world on the subject, also Jewish, by the way, uh -huh. and I explained to him, and he was a member of our team, he was a man who proved it was real blood on the shroud, and I explained to him that I was having a problem with this red blood issue uh, because old blood turns black or brown. Right. And he explained to me that when someone is tortured over a sustained period of time uh, and goes into anaphylactic shock, the red blood cell walls start to break down and the liver floods the bloodstream with bilirubin, which is an enzyme uh, created in the liver. And blood that has had that kind of treatment, if you will, will remain red forever. And what? that was corroborated by Dr. Fred Zugaby, former uh, retired now forensic pathologist of Rockland County, just north of you. Mm. And he was the medical examiner there for 35 years. And Dr. Zugaby fully confirmed what Adler told me. And that was the last piece of the puzzle. And after that, I had to accept that this is the real thing. What's All the blood stains are forensically accurate. Everything about the shroud is forensically accurate. As a matter of fact, Dr. Zugaby examined the shroud as if it were a crime scene and studied it the way forensic pathologists do with other evidence that they're, you know, from crime scene uh, victims. You, you know, uh, Barry, we're often told by people who study it, uh, scientists, that they could spend the rest of their life studying this. And uh, we have a 58 minute show. I've, I'm on every day on the Community Affairs Channel, and a lot of times people think that this is just uh, an issue of belief and an issue of faith, but it seems uh, science and f science is enhanced when there's a great enthusiasm. It's almost like focus itself involves a certain devotion to, to keep at it, and and likewise faith that's not based on reality. It, it's not well grounded either that they both need each other to grow. Well, I don't think that science and faith are mutually exclusive, frankly. Right. Well, I don't like the word faith. I mean, that doesn't mean anything to me. Um, did, it, did it change how you felt about Jesus or as a, maybe a, a divine being? Let me answer that honestly. Yeah. Uh, it did not change the way I feel about Jesus. I'm not a messianic Jew. I'm not a Christian, right? Uh, but it did force me at some point after I became convinced it was authentic and started saying so publicly, people started asking me, well, what do you believe? And they weren't talking about the shroud anymore. Right. And my answer was, I don't even know. I was raised in an Orthodox Jewish home. My parents were both from Eastern Europe. So I was first generation born here. Mm -hmm. uh, God was part of everything every day, but I walked away from it after my bar mitzvah when I was 13 and never looked back until I was 48 years old. And so it forced me in, in an effort to be honest and answer people's questions sincerely to confront my own beliefs for the first time as an adult. And I found that I was raised in a, a, a faith where I, you know, God was part of everything, and I found that my belief in God was still intact. More, more surprised than anybody else was, I think. Uh, I was totally surprised at this. But at the same time, it did sort of reconnect me to a faith in a higher power. I'm not a big fan of institutional religions, any of them. So I'm, I'm, I'm painting with the broadest brush possible. Uh, but a, a personal faith uh, or a spirituality or whatever word you want to use to describe it, 
uh, is something that I did reconnect with because of the shroud. So I think it's a pretty powerful statement for a, a Jewish guy to say that his faith in God was somewhat restored by being involved in studying this well, relic, which is, by the way, the most studied artifact in human history now. Wow. But Jesus was a Jew, and I think whatever process, let's say he did come back into the body, I think it was uh, some kind of Kabbalistic Jewish practice that was part of a secret tradition, secret Jewish tradition, I think. Or if, Egyptian, what about Egyptian? Or it could have been uh, an, a rites of Osiris, where Osiris was supposed to come back into the body. Look, you know, I think for, for time immemorial, throughout all recorded history, yeah. man has always been searching for an afterlife, or, uh, or for the concept of an afterlife, and I think that belief is sort of across all religions, that, that there's sort of a fundamental belief in an afterlife in most religions. Uh, in some religions, perhaps it's a rebirth, if you will, in being reincarnated. But again, this, these are areas that are outside my expertise. Uh, right. but, I'm, I'm not a, a biblical student or a scholar of, of the Bible, but uh, I personally believe that there is room for the shroud in people's Christian faith but it's not just necessarily for Christians. Okay, one, right. la one last question I have though, because when I was in front of the shroud, not th just where it was laying in the church in Turin, I had a feeling, I had an uplifted feeling of something, maybe I was creating it with my mind. I'm not Christian or anything, I was born Jewish, but you know, I had an uplifted feeling. Now, did you feel anything while you were holding that relic? You know, I, I get that question a lot, Alan, and, and the answer is not really, and I, but I'm going to explain why. Uh, when we got to Turin, we had 80 crates of equipment that were immediately seized by Italian customs because one crate had a radiation sticker on it. We had an x-ray machine in there. Mm -hmm. And for five days and nights, they held our equipment, and that was the week we were supposed to get everything set up in the royal palace to examine the shroud. Oh, wow. By the time we did get the equipment, we were so short of time that we were in a frenzy to get everything prepared so that when they brought the shroud to us, and because of that, we were so frenetic, there wasn't time for reflection. I see. There, there was just no way that we could spend time reflecting on, uh, you know, well, gee, what does this moment mean? Now, that's, I'm speaking for myself. I know some of the guys on the team that were Christian probably would answer that question differently. But I think that, you know, each person, and, and maybe there's become, we, we're coming to an answer about the shroud here, is that the answer isn't necessarily on the cloth. It didn't come with a book of instructions. The answer maybe is in the eye and the heart of the beholder. And so each person has to find what it means for himself. Well, you know, along those lines, when you say some of the people in your group that were Christian might have been more moved, Sometimes when you have expectations, you don't have that fresh interaction of the consciousness with the power object well, like you that. Well, I, I think that's true. I, I went there ma mainly expecting to find paint, so I certainly didn't have any deep spiritual involvement right. at the time. Mm -hmm. And so perhaps I was sort of immune from any of those feelings because of my own perspective. Yeah. And, and, and I understand that, but you know, when you're doing science, maybe that's a good thing. Right. But did you have experiences in subsequent encounters? I, I mean, are you going to be seeing it this time around? Doesn't it come I'm, out every decade? I'm leaving Maine. Well, actually, it's only about four times a century. Wow. We're pretty fortunate to be seeing it only 10 years after the last exhibition. Wow, I should uh, go. I will see it again. It probably has more meaning for me now than it did when I first saw it and spent five days and nights with it um, because it's absolutely changed my life. Well, when are you going? It absolutely changed your life. Just a second. Yeah, Let me... I'm leaving May 9th. Well, yeah. let's, can we do a show when you get back? Uh, sure. Um, no, no, Barry, let, I want to take that in a little bit more. It absolutely changed your life? It did. Starting 18 years after you touched the cloth? Correct. So it took some piece of that scientific evidence to sort of make click. It, it took all of the scientific evidence to ultimately convince me. Right. And because I was privileged to have access to all the evidence firsthand, uh, I was at least, uh, it was available to me. And part of my work with Shroud.com, and our, we now have a nonprofit, Shroud of Turin Education and Research Association, 
that supports the website. Uh, part of my goal with that was to share this information accurately, honestly, and fairly with anybody who's interested. The idea is that the media typically does not report very much in depth and very often it's not accurate. And so by creating a website where I have no spin, no bias, I don't have an answer to the shroud, I'm not selling a book, I'm not promoting myself. Uh, even you asked if my photo was on the website, and I told you no, nope, it's the Shroud website, not the Barry Schwartz website. Uh, my obligation is to give those people who are interested access to honest, fair, unbiased, accurate information and let them decide what it means for themselves. On the first page of the website, something I wrote almost, what, 14 and a half years ago, it says, given the facts, you need to make up your own mind about this. So in other words, a lot of your inspiration came from the fact that you were sort of, um, I don't know if the word's bummed out, but when, they, when somebody told you something and you realized they got it from a tabloid and here you were with this inside track, and it, it seemed like it would be unconscionable to turn your back and not to at least relay what you knew? Think about this. That's exactly right. Think. I was the documenting photographer. It was my job to document the event right. and the science and the work that was done. Who better than me, and I'm a, I'm a media guy, as you know, and who better than a guy who knows how to deal with the media, who's produced and directed thousands of interviews myself here, to, um, to be the one to bring this information to a broader public and to do it in a manner, I mean, you know, uh, the very first thing I talked about was being Jewish. I don't have a horse in this race, and from my point of view, the people out there to whom this object might have spiritual significance should be able to find a place where they can get the honest truth about it without somebody spinning it in one direction or another. Now, along those lines, Barry, about you say you have, you know, no horse in this race, uh, and then the situation of institutions, because I've really been scratching my head about how to advance really good knowledge to help people, but it's knowledge that's not promoted in the mainstream media, which is uh, an institution that people give their faith and trust to. I mean, if it's on big TV, people just tend to think it's going to be that much more reliable. Well, and when that's a shame because you and I both know that uh, just because it's on television doesn't make it true. I, I, I realize that, but I'm saying this is sort of the general, this is kind of human nature. People want to be part of a big bad club or a club mm -hmm. that's most likely to be one that's going to be successful. Now, something like the Shroud, that used to be in possession, if I'm not mistaken, of the... Uh, the Greek Orthodox Church or the Russian Orthodox. About a thousand years ago, yeah. Yeah, and then it and then it passed into the hands of the the well, Catholic yeah. Church, mm -hmm. and I well, remember actually, once it didn't become the property of the Catholic Church until 1985. Oh, really? That's, it was that's, privately that's, held. That's it right. It was privately owned by the Savoy family, the monarchy of Italy. Oh. Uh, they were living uh, when our team was granted permission to examine it. It was granted by the king. King Umberto, who was living in exile in Portugal, and he still was the legal owner of it, he granted our team permission to examine it, and the church, which had been its custodians for about 450 years, uh, and took care of it, you know, and displayed it from time to time, they were not the legal owners until King Umberto died in 1983, and in 1985, when his will was probated, it became, for the first time in its documented history, the property of the Catholic Church. I see. Now, the, the reason, though, that this is interesting, who, who owns it, is because those are the ones that can let a battery of scientists come in or not. That's now, you, you already have some objection to the carbon dating. Um, when somebody was saying it was the hydrocarbon coating, so you don't go along with that until I heard your explanation, I was going along with that. So you can see, if you were the owner, you would be kind of hard pressed to figure out which team of scientists uh, well, is, it, is qualified, you know? You have to understand this, that science has a very specific technique that it works by for it to be valid science. And that's called peer-reviewed scientific journals, or peer review. The evidence that our team brought back and presented in peer-reviewed journals uh, total 24 different scientific papers. One test, 
the radiocarbon dating, even though it was performed by three labs, they each had a piece of the same little corner. Um, that's the only test that pointed away from authenticity. All the other evidence points in favor of it. So here's the question for you. If you have, nine, if you have 100 pieces of evidence in 99 point in one direction and one points in the opposite direction, do you throw away the 99 and take the one? That's what was done with the radiocarbon dating of the shroud. Or do you re-examine that one test that is anomalous and different from all the other evidence? What, what were some of the other tests that pointed towards it? Everything that our team did. Which was, I mean, briefly. 24, well, uh, UV fluorescence photography, spectral analysis, chemical analysis. Okay. Uh, and these are all published in scientific journals. This isn't just me saying it. These are documented in the scientific literature. So when the radiocarbon dating results came out, that too was published in a scientific journal. We now have one journal article saying the shroud is a fake, and all these others saying it's not. Uh, or that it, there's no evidence of it being a painting or a photograph or, a, or a, an artwork of some sort, uh, then you get to a point where you say, well, wait a minute, if the bulk of the evidence shows that it's authentic, why did this one test get worldwide global media attention overnight and everybody saying the shroud's a fake? What's the motive here? I, I, in my mind, the motive is questionable and I cannot accept, and I don't think any good scientist should accept one test overriding dozens and dozens of other tests that point in the opposite direction. Uh, so I'm, I'm not convinced that the radiocarbon dating was accurate, and there's historic evidence in the historic record that shows the shroud is, uh, is 70 to 100 years older than the earliest date given by the carbon dating laboratory. That's, that's solid evidence that I could show you. So I, I think that there's obvious evidence in the historic record that Shroud is much older than what the radiocarbon date claimed. Right. So, so the reason they just don't want to, I mean, the scientific community is at odds with the religious community. Is that the, the reason? No, he's saying the science isn't really. No, I mean, the reason that they focused on that one test that. I would say the media. Uh -huh. I, I don't know about the scientific community because if you talk to any of the guys who were on our team who did the work that we did, we were all surprised by the radiocarbon date because all the evidence was pointing in a completely opposite direction. So what do you do if you're a scientist? Well, you don't get up on television and argue the point with the guys at the other laboratory. Science doesn't work that way. But the media <laughs> reports where there were four or five hundred media outlets that reported the shroud of fake. And in 2005, when the first evidence was published in the scientific literature showing that the corner where the sample was taken was in deep question, barely a ripple in the media, even though that's in the literature that overturns the radiocarbon date. Right. So you see, uh, the evidence against the shroud always gets the attention, and anything for it sort of gets buried on page 20. Well, why do you think that is, Barry? He's just sad why? because of the. Well, go ahead, Alan. I'd like to hear your answer. No, because the media is into maintaining a sort of um, consciousness that if it were to say it's true, it would then maybe be associated with some dogmatic Christian thing. So, so you think it's fear? I think it's fear and the fear of association as opposed to just reporting the truth, which is what the media should do. Well, you know, Alan, I agree with you, and maybe it was that fear of association that I was suffering from in those first 18 years mm -hmm. of myself being a non-Christian, sort of helping to validate uh, this Christian relic. And maybe I felt that same fear, but to me, the more overriding and more powerful force is the truth. I was given a privilege mm. to be on that team and spend five days and nights in the room with that cloth. There were probably a billion people on this planet who may have had more right to be in that room than I did, but I was there and it wasn't for me, so who else am I doing this for if not for those to whom this object means something? And I feel an obligation to give them the honest truth and let them decide what it means for themselves but to at least dispel the nonsensical stuff that keeps coming out in the media. Right. You can't tell what the you can't tell people what the object will mean to them. All you can tell them is what it is. The meaning is, like you said, self-generating. Yeah. The, each person has to decide what it means for himself. I can't get in your heart and tell you what to believe, and you can't get right. in mine. Uh, so 
my obligation is to give people access to what we truly know and let them make up their own minds. You know, uh, Barry, in the Christian religion, you, I think you have like 20 thousand different forms of Christianity yeah. and there's a whole group of Protestants and the Protestants that were protesting usually one of the main things that they're protesting is ritual and uh, ownership of, of, of relics and objects that, well, that the feeling is there shouldn't be anything between you, you know, and well, God. In my experience, uh, part of the problem is this. First of all, none of the great religions ever allowed depictions of God. It was Catholicism and the Eastern Orthodox Church that changed that with iconography about a thousand years in. Um, mm. As far as, uh, you know, the way religion works today, uh, I don't know how much is based on objects or relics, but I do know that my Protestant audiences, when I speak to them, their biggest fear is that this is something of a graven image, a manufactured image that people kneel before, and they are offended by that, and I understand that. Mm -hmm. If the shroud were a painting or a photograph and manufactured in any conventional means, I would agree with them. But mm -hmm. we know the shroud is none of those things. It was not created by the hand of a man, but some natural or perhaps supernatural interaction between the cloth and the body. So that's not a graven mm -hmm. image. That's an image that perhaps God made. And so it violates no commandment about graven images. Right. And I, I often tell that to people. That's, that's a good but, point. But, but when you said made by God, uh, I would say made by an accomplishment of uh, that we have a, a shop manual in a way about a potential that all of us have. You know, well, I, I wouldn't dispute that. I mean, that's certainly a... Well, well, that's why I like the shroud, because it does represent the potential of bringing the life force back into the body, no matter who you are. I mean, that's if, how if, I use it and if, what it means to me. If that's explanation. But the other thing, Barry, is, you know, whatever the shroud is, you still don't know if this is the burial cloth of Jesus. Well, look, we could never prove who the man on the shroud right. is. Right, right. But all of the evidence on the shroud points in only one direction. And uh, science cannot, look, if, if we had the mugshot and the fingerprints and the DNA of Jesus, the skeptics would still deny it. So, you know, I don't know that science is going to ever push us across that. Well, it's for, sure, it's for sure a big power object. I mean, there's a couple of them that come to mind. One is the Sphinx. Have you ever been to the Sphinx in the Giza Plateau? I have not, although I did see a there, documentary about it last night. Right. Well, it's, it's a wonderful experience experience. It's inspiring. There's another temple in the south of India in Tirupati. But, but let me ask him about that other piece of shroud that I think is in Spain that was just the face cloth. Do you, yes, what's the sudarium. Yeah, tell us about that and its connection. There's a piece of cloth in this Spain cloth. that goes back yes. dated uninterrupted to the 7th century. It is a much smaller piece of cloth, also linen. It has blood and fluid stains on it, and you can see where the nose and the mouth were. It was obviously wrapped around somebody's head. And if you look at both Jewish and even modern tradition, somebody gets killed in an automobile accident and they're laying on the road, the first thing we do is cover their head. Right. Well, they would have done the same with Jesus. Now, Jewish tradition requires, Jewish law requires, any blood-soaked clothing or cloth be buried with the body. And the reason for that is when you're resurrected, and Jews, by the way, invented that concept, at least in a formal manner, uh, when you're resurrected, your body needs to be intact, so all of it needs to be there. And so it was Jewish law that any blood-soaked cloth would go into the tomb with the body. According to the Gospels, there was a second cloth kept separate from the main shroud that we believe was the sedarium, and it makes sense that it was in the tomb because it contains the man's blood and other fluids, so it would have to be buried with the body. That's Jewish law. So, so do they, everything about the shroud is consistent with first century Jewish burial. So do they match this, the, that other cloth in the shroud? Do they, they, so, I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question. Do they match each other? Are they from, do they? Yes, see, there, there's, thank you, Alan, good point. The blood stains on the shroud match the blood stains on the sedarium. Visually, when you want uh, overlay one over the other, there, there's congruence. Now, uh, looking like they wrap the same head, some of the blood stains are very similar. <clears throat> so there is a strong possibility that the Sudarium of Oviedo, because it's kept in Oviedo, Spain, um, that this particular piece of cloth is associated with the shroud, 
because of it being the second clot, which is mentioned in all the Gospels. Interesting. Isn't that amazing? So uh, is that also a, a holy relic for people as well? Uh, well, I think uh, people do go there, but it's certainly not venerated the way the shroud is because uh -huh. the shroud contains an image. There's no image on the sidereum, just the blood and fluid stage. Oh, I see. You know where I'd love to go with you, Barry, sometime is to Rosabal in Kashmir. Have you heard about that? I have not. Rosabal is a purported burial place of Jesus. Oh, some yes, I have. Yes, yes I have heard of that. Some, I just didn't know the name. I'm sorry. Right. Some claim that after he resurrected, which is not the same thing as ascension, uh, he went to Kashmir, and that's something that is considered heresy. Well, and yet, when you go into Kashmir, I don't know who it is. Just like we don't know that this burial cloth is Jesus. And can never prove it either. You can't. But well, I'm when you go up there, it's pretty amazing. That, that theory that you're describing is often known as the swoon theory. It indicates that Jesus really wasn't dead and that he was resuscitated and removed from the tomb and, and went off uh, to India. As a matter of fact, some friends of mine wrote a book called uh, Jesus something like that. And uh, uh, Holger Kirsten, uh, Kirsten and Gruber, I believe, are their names from Germany. And, uh, and so there is that theory. It is somewhat of an anti-Christian theory, of course. Well, anti, it depends when you, what you mean by Christianity. I mean, you've got so 20,000 versions. Well, you have 20,000 versions, but all based on one concept of this man being resurrected. So the idea of attacking his resurrection as just being him being resuscitated is sort of trying to drive a nail into the heart of Christianity, if you, if you look at it that way. Um, I don't have a strong opinion on that. However, what's important to note is that every medical examiner and, science and forensic pathologist that's examined the shroud has been able to detect post-mortem blood flows as well as signs of mm. rigor mortis, and only dead men can have post-mortem blood flows and signs of rigor mortis. Mm. That is really fascinating. I yeah. mean, that, that shows when you talk to sci scientists that have worked with this have said they could study it for the rest of their life. Listen, everybody thinks it's simple. It's a fake or it's not. If it were so simple, I wouldn't have had to devote the last 33 years of my life trying to give people the truth about it. And if, if people say to me, well, why do you feel so compelled? What's the point? Well, look, I, I was given a real privilege to be in that room. And I feel that privilege brought with it a, an obligation. And the website and the lectures and the radio shows and television programs I do are my way of fulfilling the obligation that came with that privilege. Right. Is there anything else we can learn from the shroud, do you feel? Well, I mean, you know, there's, there really are some limits here. I mean, it's simply a piece of cloth with some stains and an image on it. Uh, there's always going to be a limit, and I think in the end, when you get down to it, we're not going to find any severely important answers on the shroud itself, perhaps other than corroborating the story of the passion of Jesus and what was done to him. But in the end, as far as spirituality or faith, I think that really it comes down to each individual regarding it and deciding for himself in his own heart what it means and acting accordingly. Hmm. Do you think that the shroud has given you energy in life? Well, uh, <laughs> my friends certainly do. <laughs> who, who, who? His friends. Your my friends. friends all think that. I, I personally believe that, it, look, I, I have a 40-year career to look back on I've done some, you know, really well-known and popular things in my career. All of that sort of pales by comparison to the work I do on the Shroud, which touches people at a level that my commercial photography and video never could. And that's something inside their hearts that is meaningful to them. So the answer is always going to be in the eye and the heart of the beholder, and not so much what's on that cloth, but what people perceive it to be, mm. what it means to them individually. So mm. if so, what I'm gathering is that you did gather energy from it, and that you're responsible to share and to give out that energy to other people. I, I think responsible is a good word. Obligated is probably a stronger word that I feel. I feel an obligation to do this. Mm. Um, you know, just recently I learned about Mennonite Christians that were living in Russia. They were of German descent, and the Romanovs invited 
invited them to come into Russia and live, and they were very uh, prosperous. And eventually, they had a deal with the Romanovs, you know, the czars. But during the revolution, uh, they no longer had the protection. And it seems as though uh, the way we know World War II is very different than when you study what went on with these people. And I keep thinking, as Mennonites and Protestants, uh, they probably wouldn't be much into the shroud. Well, and, and, I th and I thought, boy, there's a place that sure could have used a blessing, because they suffered horribly. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, human history is sort of uh, dotted with human suffering. I mean, it's, I guess it's, maybe it's just part of the deal. Mm. But uh, uh, I think that anything like the shroud that can make us consider what we believe and maybe search our hearts and, and open up to our, our beliefs or even discover our beliefs like I did, um, that's a good thing. I mean, in this day and age where things are not that great in a lot of places, things that make us consider faith or God or a higher power or spirituality or whatever you want to call it um, yeah. is, is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. So do you think it was some sort of energy that went into project that it may be a divine or something? Well, you know, I know you'd love me to say yes. No, I, I want you to say whatever you really believe. What I really, <clears throat> excuse me, what I really believe is this. Some interaction occurred between the cloth and the body that it covered. Mm -hmm. um, I cannot, with the information that we have now, give you an answer that can account for all of that. The closest is the information I gave you earlier in the program when I talked about that Maillard reaction, the interaction between the saponaria on the surface of the fibers and the amines escaping from the body. That's a scientific answer. It's not a very satisfying answer from a uh, spiritual point of view, but it's the closest thing we have to a, a process that could yield the result that we find on the shroud. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, remembering that I was part of the only real scientific team ever to examine it, the radiocarbon guys didn't examine the shroud. They were handed little pieces of it. That's it. Wow. So there was no direct examination by the radiocarbon guys. They took the samples they were given, and they tested them and came out with the results that they came out with. Wow. And uh, as I said, there's an explanation for that that's in the scientific literature. It's a valid explanation, <clears throat> which I believe casts doubt on the validity of the radiocarbon dating of the shroud. Right. Until new tests are done or other processes are available to us, I think that the, the question will remain unanswered. Thank you so much. Uh, this is Paula Gloria with Barry Schwartz. It was so nice to interact with Barry because a relic of the Catholic Church today that some people are kind of, it, it's, it, it represents suffering. It's got blood on it. It's a remind, you know, a reminder of the cruelty of man to man. And yet it's also a document of something higher that we can achieve no matter how adverse the situation. Is that fair enough, Barry? I think that that's a very good way of putting it, and uh, it ties right into what I said, that in the end, the answer is in the eye and the heart of the beholder.